the way of Will John. Guys, what's up? We have with us today the legend himself, Billy Carson. I don't even know where to start with you uh, at all, but thanks for being here, man. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be on here. I was like racing across town to make sure I didn't miss this podcast because I, I really wanted to be on here with you guys and, uh, you know, and, and uh, get a chance to talk to your, uh, you know, your following because I know you guys have done a great job building, um, building what you have. And I definitely want to be a part of that. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah. So let's get straight into it. Trying to give an introduction for you is impossible because you are a multifaceted, multi-talented man. So I would love for you to just throw it out there. <laughs> Who are you? Why do we care about Billy Carson? <laughs> there's, there's two versions. The short version is I create ripples in the space-time continuum that alter future realities in the third dimension. That's the short version. Uh, time traveling through consciousness. But the longer version <laughs> is um, you know, I'm a, I'm a music producer, an artist. Um, I'm an expert TV host on Travel Channel, Discovery Channel, History Channel, uh, Science Channel, Dame Dash TV, Forbidden Knowledge TV, which is my own TV network now, and also Gaia TV. And I'm an expert host or considered an expert host in ancient civilizations and uh, advanced technologies in aerospace and astrophysics. And so uh, I share my knowledge and wisdom on those shows and various different topics crossing the board. And, uh, and people seem to really, um, you know, relate to that. It seems to resonate with a lot of people. And I'm also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, you know, right now I've got 15 companies. Uh, and my main company right now is Forbidden Knowledge TV, which just came in at a $20 million valuation and is uh, getting ready to go into a pre-IPO phase. And um, and I've got my books that I've written, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, which is a, a bestseller now for 30 months straight. And I've got my second book, which is a month and a half old now, which is Woke Doesn't Mean Broke. And that book, this book is also now a bestseller. Uh, and uh, it's a 688 page financial Bible. <laughs> And I'm writing uh, a few books right now. Yeah, that book is, is, is just, you know, I, I'm even when I go through the book again, I'm like, you know, I'm amazed because a lot of this information is just downloaded and then backed up by statistics, you know, and uh, it has really resonated with a lot of people. I've got great reviews in there from Dr. Tara Swart, MIT neuroscience professor, uh, Robert Grant, uh, you know, Harvard mathematics professor, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of big time people, a lot of big business people and entrepreneurs gave me great reviews on this book before it was fully published. And those reviews are actually in the book. So I know I hit uh, struck a good chord there. And um it's something that's going to resonate with a lot of people. And I also own a tech company, First Class Space Agency, based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's a tech company. And so what we do is we uh, do research and development on alternative, alternative propulsion systems, uh, zero point energy devices, perpetual motion generators using, uh, you know, reverse magnetism and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of great little things that we're working on, a lot of great big projects, but we couldn't fully launch totally because of what happened in 2020. But we're looking for a relaunch of a new laboratory in 2022, summer of 2022. So I'm excited about that. I have a new battery that I invented. I have the first prototype done and ready. Uh, so I'm, pr I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, huge standing order uh, coming out of India for uh, 300 million of those batteries. So just a lot of, a lot of great stuff going on. I'm a serial, serial entrepreneur, man, producer, documentary writer now as well. I mean, I can just keep going. You know, I just really... I'm trying to utilize all my talents and fulfill everything I feel I can do in this generation and this lifetime. That is, you know, so obviously for everyone listening, you, you guys, now you can sympathize with me on trying to figure out which direction to take <laughs> the conversation because I love this. You know, uh, I, in my own uh, life, you know, aspire to bring out all the qualities and talents that I have. And we live at times and, and I'm also, uh, and I've listened to a lot of your your, your talks. I've seen a lot of your videos. You know, I have yet to read any of your books, but we're going to get into that uh, as well. And it, it seems at times within society, there's obviously, and this has probably been the case for many, many years, is that you need to follow a certain path, a path that's given through society and whether or not that's forced upon us or truly that we just kind of decided uh, it's easier to just stay in the lines. I've wanted to step outside of that. Um, and so, you know, the general state and nature of professional athletes is that they're dumb uh they only do the sport uh you know it's just there's not a whole lot to them and um 
my hope and desire was always that I could use sports and use soccer in order to, you know, push and supplement everything else uh, that I wanted to do. And so that's kind of what we've, that's the approach we've taken at Golaremi uh, is that, and, you know, uh, we're launching just a little bit later this year, some stuff on language and, uh, you know, being a polyglot is a huge part of my life and, and stuff like that. So it's inspiring to see you do all of this. I mean, I've just been trying to soak up all of the, the knowledge. So why don't we start? Um, honestly, I think guys are, are clearly going to be interested in, in all that. But considering some of the news that's going on right now with the aerospace technology and Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos having the billionaire fight to, to go on, what are you trying to do with your tech company? Uh, and what do you think of all the stuff that's going on right now? A lot of great stuff going on in private space. Uh, I mean, amazing stuff. And so uh, every year I go to the space symposium and uh, I have, you know, TS clearance, top secret clearance in private space. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that has, you know, I've seen now from three, four years ago that now is actually coming to fruition, which is phenomenal. And so my tech company and, and my space agency is not for, you know, creating launchable vehicles, but to provide ancillary product services and technology and research to existing launch capable space agencies. And so that's what we're into. A, there's over a hundred space agencies in the United States, but nobody ever hears about them. They're, they don't launch. We just provide services, research, uh, technology, you know, radiation, hard computer circuit boards and things like that that you need to go into space with uh, to the big agencies that launch like, you know, um, Blue Origin or SpaceX or NASA or the European Space Agency. And, uh, and so there's a lot of great stuff going on. Of course, we know now that there's this huge space push for space, private space. The governments are moving into private space because if you move into private space, then nobody can do a Freedom of Information Act and request to find out exactly what you're doing up there. <laughs> you know, and if you're military, which they've pushed a lot of it to military, then, of course, we can't get any of that information once it's declared top secret. So, for example, uh, we have a U, uh, we have a, a, a military shuttle. The United States does. Uh, it's called the uh, 33B, I believe it is. And this shuttle is a private military shuttle that actually launches on its own power. It doesn't have these gigantic rocket boosters like the old shuttles of uh, you know of the 90s and so forth. But it launches, goes into space, and it goes away for two years at a time. It's a cargo ship. They can't tell you where it's going. They can show you the launch and they'll show you the landing, but they won't tell you exactly <laughs> where it's gone for two years. You know, so there's a lot of stuff. So that's what the big move is now to private space and military so that we, the citizens, can't get any information as to exactly what's going on. They're keeping everything private from us. And the whole UFO UAP thing, the government has been well aware of UFOs for many, many decades. Uh, it's not even a mystery. And then, of course, now the new terminology is UAP. Uh, unknown, you know, aerial phenomenon. And what they're trying to say is the term UFO is for the crazies. We're going to call it UAPs. This is for the professional people. So from this point forward, you only hear UAP coming out of anything official, anything that's supposed to be, quote unquote, you know, the uh, the, the, the official statement or the, or the official document. It's always going to say UAP now. And so they're trying to say that we're not the ones with the tinfoil hats. Uh, and the report came out and on that report, it showed that they are uh, completely, according to them, unaware of exactly what is going on, that some of these craft are maneuvering in ways that, that they can't conceive of. But what they are not disclosing is the fact that we have ships right now. We have you know aerospace technology that can duplicate the majority of those uh, maneuvers. And uh, that's on the, the Aurora project where we have the TR-3B. Yeah. And so some of these UAPs that they're claiming they don't know what they are, they know exactly what they are, but they're utilizing them to generate money. And so we've run out of, we meaning the military industrial complex, have run out of new wars to, to create on the planet. You know, we're pulling out of Afghanistan, that's dried up. Of course, we can't get any more money. We, we wrung Iraq dry. We literally took a towel and squeezed every last drop out of Iraq. And uh, we've gone around the entire planet to every uh, indigenous uh, third world country we could to bring democracy. And now the war machine is drying up, the money is drying up. What's the next big way to make money? Space. We got the Space Force. Now we've got to direct trillions of dollars into this Space Force, but we've got to get the support of the people. How do we do that? These UAPs are a threat to national security. And so we need to create space weapons. And so now we're going to see this creation of space weapons. And a lot of this stuff I'll, I'll be talking about this Saturday coming up. I'm doing an 11-hour 
conference with one of the former Pentagon employees that made the actual disclosure statement that we are in possession of vehicles not of this world. Lou Elizondo will be in my workshop this Saturday. And uh, those tickets are available on eventbrite.com. It's the Forbidden Disclosure Conference. 11 hours of real disclosure that the government will not give you and we can't announce on any mainstream platform. Wow, okay. So, uh, tons in here. I mean, we I've tried to pay attention because we actually had a fighter pilot on that podcast just isn't out just yet. And I kind of, I asked him about the whole UFO, UAP controversy and stuff and with the government just now coming out and announcing this, which is, I mean, is as far as my little take on it, which is just kind of hilarious because clearly this is something that is, first off, the ones that they've just released are from years ago, right? I mean, it's not like that happened in right. 2020. So then it just begs the question, you got to start going, all right, so how long did you know? What what ha, what sort of conclusions yeah. have you guys drawn? Because no conclusions were mm-hmm. obviously when you watch CNN, they don't come to yeah. any conclusions. They just say we don't know, blah 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 blah. Right. And mm-hmm. we all know that they're they have to have come to a bit <laughs> further than that than what they're what they're what they're saying. So uh, it, it it begs a question. You've basically come to your analysis of the situation in saying they've stated essentially that these uaps are there we don't know what they're doing however they could be a threat therefore let's defend ourselves with i mean i don't want to go down the the entire route since we don't technically know since we're, we're still here uh, in the past but is stephen greer has this has put out the the essential idea that this is a the government is, is going to fake some sort of false flag attack. Are you of that nature? Or do you think that they even need to do that in order to, to achieve their goal of expanding space and space war? Like, How do you see that playing out over the next, whatever, 10 years? Yeah, I think that he has a very good point there. A lot of people think that they're going to use this, uh, this holographic technology to fake a space war. I don't think they're going to do that because the risk of that failing is too huge. And that would just be a disaster to, to, to invest all that energy into something that would completely flip flop the entire government. And we'd, that flip flop, we we'd overthrow the government five seconds after that. But I think what they will do is they'll take one of the one of our existing, uh, I know, um, flight you know vehicles that we have, most likely one of the Aurora TR three Bs or something like that, and they will buzz uh, buzz you know fly over some marine vessels or fly over a city real low and. And they'll claim that they'll fly over, fly over a military base and they'll record that and give it to the public and say, hey, these things are threatening us, you know. And uh, and so because of that, we need to move 17 trillion dollars over here into this budget so that we can do this, this, this and this. And meanwhile, they take that money and then they push that money into private contractors, which, of course, they sit on the board of directors of or they're in the taking of underneath the table of a lot of these corporations and companies, or they got relatives in these companies and so forth. Kind of like what, you know, you saw Halliburton do and everything else in Iraq, where you had Dick Cheney make $34 billion in order the board of directors were some big names out of DC. And then they built like one gas station for $23 million. And they built a couple of schools and a couple of houses and they kept the rest of that money in their pockets. And so the same thing is going to go on with this space thing, with this space war. So I think Dr. Stephen Greer has a very good point there wherein they will probably fake some kind of, not attack, but in my opinion, but I think they will will um, will show as something is a threat to the point where we need to just justify this money. Right. Okay. Well, that makes, I mean, that makes sense. It's hard for a lot of people who are just hearing this for the first time that don't have maybe a grasp on A, the UFO technology or what, you know, is, is being uh, reported along with the uh, idea, and I think we've seen this over the course of, obviously, I'd say a year to two years, it's clearly been declining. Faith in the government and what the government says has clearly, it's at a pretty all-time low, I would would say, um, right now, where there's a lot of people who don't feel as if the government is giving them the correct answers, be that with UFOs, COVID, uh, you know, just the the way things are run. And so, but for, for people that are out there, is there any is there any way you could give and this is slightly on topic and slightly off if i just asked the question who's ruling the world and you had to you had to simplify that uh to the to the best way you could without maybe you can't name people but how do you see the the structure of government 
in the world right now and who's making the power plays? How do you see that? Yeah, well, it's definitely a pyramid that we're in. And uh, and, and we, the citizens, are at the very bottom of this pyramid. <laughs> uh, there are less than 100 families that control and run 7.7 billion people right now. Seven point, think about this number. 7.7 .7 billion people are being controlled by less than 100 families. And at the top of that 100 family list, there's only really about five big players that are making the top, top, top key decisions. And so you have this structure where you have these elite oligarchs. Uh, I don't know if I can name these people on your platform or not. I don't want to have you flagged or whatever, but <laughs> you can. Um, I mean, for me, it, you have for me it's fine. I mean, it's yeah. OK. All right. well, if you don't mind, yeah. So you have Rockefeller and Rockefeller mm -hmm. at the very, very top of this uh, oligarch uh, hegemonic matrix. Mm -hmm. And uh, underneath them, then you have the uh, the black pope. And I'm not talking about a black man. I'm talking about the black pope. He wears a black garb. He's called the black pope. So underneath Rock, Rockefeller and Rockefeller, you have the black pope. And then underneath that, you have then have the military industrial complex, which is primarily run out of the U.S., but still is in full collusion with the bigger countries of the world. And, uh, and then underneath that, then you have uh, the politicians and Oh, I'm sorry. Under that, under that, you have the CIA and the FBI, uh, and then you have the the president. Then you have the politicians. So it's a step down process all the way till you get down to the citizens. It's this huge pyramid matrix that we're in. Um, but at the very top, and since ancient times that the power sh structure was set up that way. If you look into the Sumerian tablets, you find that there was an ancient pyramid war that was started by Amun Ra, also known as Marduk in the modern day Bible in the Jewish Torah, and also in the Enuma Elish. And uh, he, when he tried to escape from this, uh, this last battle, which he did escape, he made a decree and left the kingship to his Ra Kam. And Kam, K-A-M, translates into shield in the modern idiom. And so when you look at this from 6,000 years ago, he left the control of the kingdom and the finances to the Ra shield. <laughs> so over time, the name has evolved into Rothschilds or Rothschilds, however you want to pronounce it. But those are the same people because the the the, the pharaohs uh, migrated across out of Africa, across Europe, uh, across into Europe, and then became the monarchy that you see there today, mating along the way. And uh, and you know by the time that we got to that last dynastic era, Egypt started out with primarily uh, a lot of black people, and this is uh, pre-dynastic in the land of when it's called the land of Kem. But people don't realize that historically Egypt and Kem was over, well, Kem was overthrown first and the Dogons, who were the first people there, had to go migrate to Mali, the survivors, which is still live in Mali, Africa today. And then after that, Egypt was overthrown seven more times by seven different races. So all that commingling of races and then that migration into Europe, the next thing you know, you have, um, you know, you have Caucasian people with, with Egyptian lineage. This is why if you go to the UK, you'll see that the, the palaces and everything else have this Egyptian motif. And then you come across the way into the Americas and you go to DC, you find out that all the buildings there have this Egyptian motif. And as a matter of fact, if you go to the Library of Congress, those two gigantic steel doors, on one side you have Thoth, you know, the Atlantean priest king from Egypt that you see in all of the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And then on the other door you have Odin, who's actually the same person, but the Greek version uh, of him. So. They know about this well and good, man. This is not even a mystery to them. You know, it's a, they, they know all about the true history and the true information. But that's the that's the, um, you know, the, 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 the I guess you could say structure. the totem pole, uh -huh. the power structure. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have two things even on that. It's all, uh, fascinating to hear any of this, because I think for the average citizen, a lot of them also. And one of the things that's really cool about what you do in educating people on this, most people just don't give a shit. It's just kind of like a. I've, I went to the store, I got my food, I went to my, my work, I've got kids, I've got this, I got bills to pay. And, and a lot of people don't take time to study history um, and not just history, also uh, to look at history and to, and to understand how we got here and also to look at things that are going on out of your control and try and get a grasp on what's moving. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the things that has been most fascinating to me in, in speaking to people that are incredibly intelligent and that are, that are searching for things like this, like you, was that uh, regardless of if you want to call it a conspiracy where people are working together to do it, it doesn't necessarily have to be if, they are, if, if something is controlling their 
their forward movement, whether that's money and it makes sense for them to work, uh, if they need to collude for this because it's in their best interest. If self-interest, you know, in maintaining power, if it just means I, I don't need to mess with you or, hey, if we both put money in, we all do this in our lives. I mean, that's what nation states are people colluding together to make the nation state better and at some times push the other state down. I mean, so it, it's, you know, to see this on, on this, uh, it, uh, we are all kind of a microcosm of that and we don't have to, to, to be obviously so negative towards, towards each other and, and this whole thing. And, and so I see people saying, well, I wouldn't do that. And it's important obviously to understand you can't necessarily perceive someone else's actions from your state of consciousness. Uh, and so when you see someone, they say, how could they do that? This seems like that. Well, if you had their experience and their understanding and you were in their state of mind, then it would seem possibly logical to you or even just. Uh, so I, I would on that note, because you are saying things that people have no idea, I know you travel the world and do a lot of research. So how have you come to those conclusions? Because you're saying things that people are hearing and, and some people might be thinking, well, how, what, where are you getting this from? You know, so why? Yeah, these aren't conspiracy, what I'm talking about. These are actual stated, uh, in stated information by our ancestors. And so, yes, I've traveled the world. I've been around the world three times. Now I'm getting, re getting ready to make another world trip now. I'm going to kick off actually in a couple of weeks starting out in Athens, Greece. But um, I've gone through over a thousand uh, ancient texts, cylinder scrolls, papyruses, parchment papers, scriptures, hieroglyphs, uh, uh, cuneiform tablets, Sanskrit. Uh, there's over a thousand books right here just in my house where I'm sitting. So uh, in going through this information, analyzing this text, sitting with indigenous elders, sitting with sages, and Bushmen from all around the world and getting this information firsthand, you find out their verbal handed down history. You find out the recorded history left behind by our ancestors thousands of years ago that are making these claims. So the claims aren't coming from me. I'm just making uh, well known what the ancients have already stated and written down and is right in plain sight. It's hiding right in plain sight everywhere you turn. If you have the time to go and read and study and research, it's all right there. It's all laid out. In the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, Enlil, who's also known as Yahweh in the modern day Bible, he's, he's the God that came into Eden to, to, to find out that Adam and Eve had gained knowledge from his brother, Enki, who, who he called the serpent. But um, so Enlil, uh, he's showing his sister on this crystal tablet. Not, remember, this is 6,000 year old text in cuneiform stone tablets etched into stone, right? He's showing her on a crystal tablet his plan for all time on how to build cities, on how to build, this is for humans to control them, on how to build uh, sewage and plumbing systems, on how to put and install a bicameral Congress, on how to install different types of financial monetary systems, which he did. There's a great book by William Bramley called The Gods of Eden. I recommend everyone read that because it's based on the Sumerian tablets. We've got over a million tablets that we've now acquired. And then the majority of those are IOUs, like, like money, like we walk around money in our pocket, same exact thing. And it shows that the financial system, how it was installed and set up and how they also injected inflation into the system over 6,000 years ago. So politics and all this stuff all originated out of Iraq. That was the cradle of civilization. That's where all this originates from. And it then migrated across here and we're utilizing that same exact system and the same exact city structures and the same exact monetary educational systems that was installed by this guy. And he said for all time, he said, and his system, it creates this um, hegemonic power structure that, that, like you said, people are a part of without even knowing they're a part of it. They're just living their everyday lives with the way that the system is set up it boxes you in to allow this system to continue to progress forward nonstop generation after generation. And so that's the system that we're living in right now. So then with, with, with that being said, and you having studied all of those things, uh, especially what I would consider secret knowledge uh, to the sense that it's not truly secret because anyone could go after it. It's that we don't, uh, we don't ask the right questions. And that's one of the keys um, to everything. Um, I found for sure and and from the people that we've discussed so with that in mind what are the top if you can give it top three maybe five things that you have let's say discovered or uncovered from studying the secret knowledge that would apply to us 
now and today. And uh, we're going to get into meditation here because I definitely know you uh, you, you do that, and um, obviously you take good care of yourself uh, and all that. But what are what are some of the most common practical things that someone who's just listening to this can say? All right, well, so you went and studied that. What did you learn that can help me now be better, earn more, whatever? Right. Well, I think one of the biggest things is um, the power of the word, the power of the spoken word, the power of actually speaking words and using conscious intent behind those words. This is coming out of the Emerald Tablets. You know, Thoth talks about this. I had to write a book about it because it's too powerful. He talks about the fact that when you use conscious light waves, which are when you every time you every every time you think every thought, including the thoughts that people are thinking right now, just to watch this video is creating a light wave that's leaving from their skull and going out into space time. And that light wave is an electromagnetic wave that's engraved or, or, or I say, say piggyback with data on it. And so that data, every thought that you've ever thought and everyone else's thoughts exists in space time all around us, just like radio waves coming out from a radio station and propagating through space for all eternity. If you're 10 light years away and you pick up the, uh, you know, the I Love Lucy from 1960 frequency, you can watch it no matter where you are in the galaxy. And so the same thing is happening with all of our thoughts. So in that case, you know, the book of life is actually real. And so understanding that the spoken word and the light waves that combine together, cymatic frequencies coming out of your throat and conscious light waves combine together to literally create your reality tunnel. So the most important thing I can say for today that we can utilize today is to understand every word you speak, analyze it before you speak it. Because you literally have power over, over your life, over space time itself, over multiple realities that exist. So every single person is living in what we call a superposition of potentials. And so these superpositions of potentials in quantum physics mean that any reality that could happen can happen. But according to the ancient Sumerian tablets, you have the ordainers of destiny who are able to analyze all the different probabilities and then pick a specific one that they wanted to align with their reality tunnel. And they, what they would do is they would use vocalization, speaking into existence, conscious thought backed by it to create the reality that they wanted. And then they would put action behind those thoughts and those, and those vocalizations. And so today you'd say, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, if you're trying to obtain something like, um, you know, a new house, a new car, a new job, a new uh, relationship, whatever it is, you have to speak into existence, put conscious thought behind it, and then take action behind those thoughts to bring it into your reality tunnel and focusing, like, it's like focusing a beam and bring it into your reality. No matter what it is, whatever you want to be good at, whatever you want to achieve, whatever you want to accomplish, whether it's traveling on trips or taking trips around the world, whatever it is, you speak it into existence and you speak with confidence and power and never, ever, ever speak bad about yourself. I suck. I can't do this. I'm horrible at this. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, all those type of terminology, you're literally creating that reality for yourself. And the power, people don't understand the law of attraction works in both ways. Another thing the ancients talked about, the law of attraction works where if you send out positive high frequency information into the universe, you're going to get positive high frequency back. But if you're consistently talking low frequency, begging, pleading, hoping, angry, frustration, uh, you know, doubting and all those low frequency type of things, then that's going to come back to you as well. So you're going to create the reality that you're putting out. So if you ever call somebody and they're always, every time you talk to them, they got bad news. It's like nonstop. You already know when you see them on the phone, it's going to be another sob story. That person is literally creating this boomerang effect of low frequency information and low frequency realities coming back right into their life on a consistent basis. That's why you got to run away from those kind of people. It's contagious. And so you want to be speaking positive. You want to be speaking, if there's something you can't do, don't say I suck at this or I don't know how to do this. Say, I'm going to figure this out. I need to contact somebody to help me with this. It's all about restructuring how you say things and how you view things. I'm going to become an expert at this. I am going to be great at this. You know, I'm going to excel. And all the, this is just flipping it around. You flip that switch and all of a sudden your reality begins to change. Little by little, the things that you need to come into your life to help you achieve and acquire and be successful start to just manifest right before your eyes. And the next thing you know, you're succeeding, you're excelling, you're doing, you know, phenomenal. And that's how I look at everything. Everything that I decide that I want to do, I, I automatically assume I'm going to become an expert at it. I never have any doubt. What There's like zero doubt. There's zero doubt. I don't care what anybody says, what anybody feels, what trolls say on social media, what people tell me, family members tell me. 
I can I just ignored him. I have thick skin. I believe I can be an expert. If I if Michael Jordan contacted me right now and said, would you like to play in a one on one? Knowing that it's Michael Jordan, he can be in his prime. And if I take the challenge, I'm going to that means I believe I can beat Michael Jordan that day. Now, are the odds against me that I probably will lose? Yes. But if I take the challenge, then I believe in my heart of heart, mind of mind. And when I speak it, yes. Now the consciousness go behind that. I believe I can beat him that day. And so it, it, a lot of people out here taking on challenges that they don't believe that they can actually win. And if you're doing that, you lost before you even started. So, you know, this is these are all ancient teachings. This comes from the Egyptian mystery schools. You know, it's ancient stuff. That is, you know, I mean, you touched on so much that is also such a key. And as a matter of fact, today we just put out a video on anxiety, which is one of the a huge thing, obviously, in our society that's definitely increased over the course of the last, whatever, 10 years or 15 years with the, you know, with social media. And trying to combat that is the thing that you try and you want people to, to understand that they have to, when you want to be confident, it sounds insane, but you have to feel confident before the confidence actually starts to come into your life. You have to feel like you're a champion before you become a champion. It's crazy to, to say and, and think. And one of the people who I think exhibits this well, and I'm sure you've heard of or probably even read his books, Neville Goddard. Uh, and uh, do you know Neville Goddard by chance? Oh, yeah. Of course. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. I mean, there and there are probably at this point, there are probably millions, not just thousands. There are probably millions of books and, uh, you know, teachers. And that whole new thought era is fascinating to me. Um, you know, I think it, it, it did and does sort of get watered down when it became the new age uh, because there's a whole lot in there and some of the message kind of get, gets a little watered down. But that, you know, I had Dean Radin uh, on here. We had him on earlier this year, I think it was, or maybe even the, the end of last year. And, you know, for a guy who's studying this, this stuff, it's one of the messages that I think is probably most life-changing for people who are, A, hearing it for the first time, or if they listen to this podcast, this is another, another time they're hearing someone successful come on and mention that this is the key to my success. This is, you know, what's driven me to get all the things that I have. And I'm telling you that this is what you can use now. So in that sense, if we could even get more practical, because I know you meditate, how does someone try and do this step one? All right, cool. So my thoughts are controlling my reality, but I want it now. So there's, there's two parts to that. Most people aren't going to, it's hard to, to, to stay persistent, especially when you and your thoughts maybe were negative before and everything around you is telling you that you suck at whatever it is that you're trying to do. So uh, I'm going to ask the practical question that some people are having. All right, I'm going to test this. How long do I have to do this thought thing that you're saying? And what specifically do I have to do? Do I have to sit down and meditate like a, a monk or give me a way to do this uh, after I'm done with this podcast that I can continue to do and then test and say, is my life better now? Right, right. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. So I'm glad you said that. So basically what I recommend first and foremost, we have to understand that we are we have been programmed since birth, especially the first seven years of our life. We've been heavily, heavily programmed from all different types of external sources that create the person that we are today. And so we have to first overwrite that programming. And we now know scientifically proven. I learned this at MIT when I took a course there in applied neuroscience. We have to speak positive affirmations to ourselves three times a day for 21 days. I recommend going further than 21 days, continuing on nonstop. So I, I, I created a song called Affirmations by Forbidden Knowledge. And so that people will learn the words that hit, listen to it almost every day and continue that positive affirmation talk. Because what happens after 21 days, your DNA rewrites itself. I mean, literally like the coding in the DNA begins to reconfigure and rewrite itself. So you go from these low frequency systems that have been incorporated into your DNA to these high frequency, positive, high vibrational systems in the DNA, you've been reprogrammed. At the same time that you're doing that, you want to start meditation practices because meditation practices are super massive for your growth and, and, and your success. Um, a lot of the biggest people in the world in terms of success, they all meditate. And there's a reason why they're doing this. It's because they found out that it gives you a lot of um, uh, incredible benefits. The first benefit is it's going to help you clear the chaos out of your mind. A lot of the reasons why people don't get things done is because of the chaos going on in the mind. And so they've been filled all the way up with all this chaotic thought and all this entropy 
and now there's no room for anything else. Or oh, I've got this checklist of things I have to get done. They can't get to the first thing because they're full. They have no more space. So the, what happens in the meditation, it begins to take this chaos and this entropy and reduce it inside the body, eliminating it from the body. Like I tell people in my meditation, I do a meditation Monday, every Monday morning for free on my YouTube account. And you just log in there at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I guide you through. I see a bowl. You have to see a bowl in your mind and a hand reaching into that bowl and taking out the thoughts little by little until that bowl is virtually empty. It's hard to get it completely empty, especially for beginners. But getting it almost empty, that's reducing the chaos. And then, uh, then getting into the meditation, there's several types of meditations that I teach. I teach a Merkaba meditation. I teach a manifestation meditation. We do a gong bath meditation. I've got all these various different meditations that I, that I teach. Uh, you know, so you, you have to pick one. If it's a manifestation meditation, then you, whatever it is you're trying to manifest, you actually live that in your mind. You don't go, you don't see yourself as if um, I'm going to go, you know, drive, go test drive this car on Tuesday and think about buying it. You see it as if you've already bought the car and you actually have the keys and you're starting it up and you're driving it to a friend to show off your brand new car. It's a whole different way of thinking about things. If it's a brand new house or new apartment or condo, you see yourself getting the keys in your hand from the realtor or the agency, or whoever you, you bought it from, and you're opening your door and you're going to go inside and you're going to start, you know, getting your furniture deliveries, sitting on your couch, watching a brand new, you know, watching on your brand new TV, watching a new show or something or whatever it is. You're living it. So in the manifestation meditation, I teach people to live the actual manifestation as if it already happened. That's the most important manifestation meditation is you actually you're actually believing it happened before it even happened. And you actually because I think in the ethereal plane and the consciousness platform, that's where the true reality lies. And then this third dimensional platform is actually an illusion. So once you take it and make it happen and, and, and coalesce inside the consciousness platform, then in the third dimension, it becomes just a piece of cake. It becomes extremely easy. You know, so the meditation technique. So, again, uh, you know, you want to you want to meditate. You want to speak positive affirmations. You want to meditate, meditate every day for like just 10 minutes. People go, I can't meditate for a long time. I, my average meditation I do actually on Monday morning is 11 minutes and 11 seconds. Every now and then I do a 22 minute, 22 second meditation, right? So that's all you need. That's literally all you need. Do it very early in the morning when everybody's still asleep. So all the chaos is down. All the entropy in the world is down. The next thing I highly recommend is organize yourself. Organize your house, your office desk. If you are a person that has a very junky house, a very junky garage, uh, you know, um, junky kitchen that what you're looking at when you see that mess is you're seeing what's in here manifesting on the outside. Everything starts as a thought. Everything starts internally in inner space. And then in inner space, when it fills up, it overflows to the outer space. Organize yourself, clean up your messes, get your laundry folded. Stop leaving your laundry inside the laundry room for six months unfolded picking out of clean clothes and trying to figure out what's, is this clean? Is that clean? <laughs> we got, you got to clean, you got to clean it. Once you organize and straighten up and clean up that mess, it's going to give you space. That Zen that you're going to get from seeing it. If you can't do it yourself, hire somebody, pay somebody a hundred bucks, 200 bucks to clean and organize your house. It's the most important thing. Get that Zen going. Okay. Cause you have, you have to have you go into the inner space and clean up. You got to also clean up the outer space. Once you're doing the, the affirmations, you're doing the meditations, You've now got your, your work area, your home area where you lay your head clean and organized. You're going to start to see so many things just start to happen because now you're on, you're on this Zen frequency and where literally you just create a thought in your head and speak it. And all of a sudden it just becomes reality. People fall into your life. Opportunities come into position that allow you to make that step to the leap to get exactly what you're trying to create or manifest. And but you can't get there with the chaos and entropy because you'll never even be able to see it. You've got blinders on with the entropy and the chaos. And so those are the three things I highly recommend that people do when they're trying to, you know, create a better reality for themselves. I mean, that is first off, uh, unbelievably, I, I've, I've, I've not talked to anybody who has been able to actually <laughs> uh, convey it like that, um, because it reminds me when you talk about entropy and order of I ran into a clip of Bob Proctor, who obviously I'm sure you know, um, uh, oh, yeah. where he says order is heaven's first law. And mm. in its in it, in it, just in that statement, it kind of there's some stuff to decode yeah. there. What does that necessarily mean? Order is heaven's first law. Um, but it on another 
note, it also reminds me of the advice that Jordan Peterson gives to, as a clinical psychologist, gives to a lot of his patients at first, which is like, they don't know, they're overwhelmed by depression or, uh, you know, anxiety. And he's just like, can you pick up, can you clean your room? Can you pick up one thing in your room and put that in its place? You have control over that. And that's, you know, which is interesting because it's almost, I mean, there's the, 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 the famous saying, obviously, as within, so without, as without, you know, so within, and that's a way for someone who may not be meditating yet to take control of their world. And, you know, they're, they're, they're correlated. They're correlated in ways that our society is just not at a point where we're ready to just as a whole all talk about and just go, this is a fact. This is what's going on. Clearly science is, is on its way there. You know, like we said, we have Dean, Dean Radin and, and we're going to come to a point obviously where it's, it's going to be undeniable uh, that the placebo effect isn't just the placebo effect. I think we're going to start to say that we have some sort of talent, you know, um, and, I want to even go even, I guess, deeper. My, my, my brain is telling me that I want to, I want to talk at least also about, oh, uh, before, I, before I forget. So you were mentioning cars. Guys, Billy's giving away a Rolls Royce. So why don't you say, why don't you tell, tell him about that first? Yeah. So I have a Rolls Royce. It's previously owned. You can't call a Rolls Royce an old car because it, that doesn't exist. Rolls Royce doesn't have, there's no old and Rolls Royce don't go together. They're only previously owned. They're all works of art because every car is hand built. 45 people worked on that car for six months to create their vehicle. Uh, so uh, it's a hand-built car. It's a Rolls-Royce Ghost. I bought a new car, a, a brand new Rolls-Royce. And so this was my previous one. It's uh, still in phenomenal condition. You can see it on my website at 4 knowledgecom with the number 4, 4 knowledgecom Go to giveaways. It's a raffle, 50 bucks a ticket. And the more tickets you buy, the lower the price of the raffle ticket. Uh, and so the proceeds of this are going to go to underprivileged children for holiday gifts, school book bags, school supplies, and also single family final notice electric bills this winter. And uh, so I could have just sold the car, could have, you know, whatever, or traded it in. But I decided to try to find a way to make it work for both sides, help people and also give somebody an opportunity to take a vehicle that they probably would never have a chance to get. And they can sell it immediately, you know, take about, you know, about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand and invest it into a business, invest it on the stock market, buy properties, get into real estate flipping, uh, you know, co college tuitions, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, uh, it's your money. It'll be shipped anywhere in the world. It's a third party raffle. It'll be uh, the car will be held. The raffle will be held. I'm sorry, at Holman Motor Cars, which is a Rolls Royce, deal Rolls Royce dealership that I bought my new car from in Fort Lauderdale, Florida on Sunrise Boulevard. And I'll be there that day signing autographs and everything else at the dealership if somebody wants to come by and hang out or whatever. If you can't make it, it doesn't matter. The vehicle will be shipped to you as a winner anywhere you are in the world. Wow. Okay. So, guys, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, not everybody is at the state where they can just drop and get a Rolls Royce. So if you want that, the link is going to be on uh, down below in the description or it's in the show notes. But because you're mentioning uh, that if you say you win it, and you could start a business and do stuff. I know you mentioned earlier, um, and actually two things. Let me let me just rewind here. I I was watching a video of yours, must have been some time ago, where you mentioned possibly Ray Dalio, but you mentioned how you had to some degree foreseen what was gonna happen with the crash of March last year. So that, I think that's a good segue into a lot of the young guys here who, you know, are going to want to learn about options, learn about stocks. I mean, we've seen that boom happen over it. I myself, you know, uh, was lucky enough to have a mom who stressed that stuff to me. And, uh, you know, since 2008, since I left the, the, the MLS, I've, I've handled my passive income and stuff like that. I've handled my portfolio on my own. Um, so, but for guys that are about that, you know, uh, how did you understand that? How did you foresee that? And what is it you're, you're going to be teaching some stuff on option stocks? So why don't we just get into all of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, in November 2019, Ray Dalio, who's uh, a best-selling author and the controller, uh, the manager, I should say, of one of the world's largest hedge funds. The hedge fund has $150 billion in it. Okay. This guy's in charge of that. And so in November 2019, he took 1.5 billion of the 150 billion and he did a put on the stock market 
for March of 2020, or what we call a long put. He bet that the market would crash March of 2020. Now, I follow this guy because obviously I'm trading stocks and options and, and, and buying and holding and swing trading and everything else. And I'm going, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy's saying the market's going to crash. He's so confident he put $1.5 on it. So there's got to be something here. So as we got closer to March, we, of course, we started having the shutdowns happening. And I was just getting back from uh, Australia on, on an expedition out there in the Outback. And I barely made it back before they closed that down. And then I'm going, oh, man, this is the reason. This is what's happening. This is why it's going to crash. How did he know this? Like, how in the world did he get this information? He got it from somewhere. Somehow he knew you don't you don't just put one for one point five billion that many months in advance on the line, because in a put in a put option, if it doesn't go that way, you can actually lose the majority of that money. If you don't have a stop loss or whatever, you can lose five hundred thousand of it or five hundred million of it. You know, really, it could be just that quick. It's gone. Didn't happen. Time decay can take effect and you can lose a lot, a lot of money. And that's not even his money. It's other people's money. So it's dangerous. So he had to be very confident to do that. So I started pulling back off the stock market uh, in February because I was like, in March, this thing looks like it's getting rid of the tank. And I just gently, you know, did the moonwalk. <laughs> Whatever I had that I was buying, holding, I kept that. And here it comes. Sure enough, March 2020. Kaboom. Right. I was like, wow. But in that came a lot of great opportunities that made a lot of new millionaires where if you were smart and you were saving money, not spending money on strip clubs and drugs and hanging out and things that depreciate in value. If you were saving money for an opportunity to ar would arise in your life, then you had the great, you, then you would have had some money in your pocket to buy when all the stocks crash because you buy on the dip. How you, be how you become wealthy is you buy on the dip. When everything goes down, that's when you buy, that's when you snatch, that's when you, you, you snatch it up. Same thing with real estate. If real estate, if the real estate market crashes again, which it is going to probably crash in the next three years, the peak is going to, it's going to come, it's going to crash again. Uh, it may not be as bad as 2008, but there will be a crash. You have to be really ready to snatch up these properties. There's going to be an uh, open market here. You're going to be able to grab and, you know, and, and snatch these, real, these wholesale properties up and then resell them at retail rates uh, or rent them out and have some rental income. So this was a golden opportunity. And so I'm teaching this and teaching how to invest in stocks and options. It's an options trading workshop coming up August the 7th. It's going to be a four hour class. Uh, you can go to um, Eventbrite and just type in Billy Carson options and it should pop up. The link is probably going to be here for you. So I'm teaching an options class August 7th. And on this options class, class uh, I'm going to be teaching how to trade stock options and make about $1,000 a day, which is very mild and, you know, pretty actually, you know, there was a risk involved, but it's, it's fairly easy to do. It's a very conservative number to and a realistic goal to set to, you know, to make a thousand. On certain days I make five, 10,000, sometimes 50,000. I mean, the other day I made a hundred thousand in a day off of AMC when AMC exploded. I bought an option call on it and it just kept rising. Uh, the market froze it for two times. And when, when it came out of freezing for the, for the second time, I heard and sold my options. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're not going to catch me on a third one. But um, so I'll be, tra I'll be teaching this workshop and teaching people how to momo trade. You know, momentum trade is what I like to do. I like to teach you my technique on momentum trading, how I trade Tesla every single day and options for puts and calls. And I'm going to teach people how every single stock has its own heartbeat, its own rhythm. And you can pretty much predict these rises and falls and how to get in and out of trades really quick and take short profits, not making, you know, $100,000 in a day. Just make four or 500 bucks real quick. Boom. OK, another 15 minutes, make another four or 500 bucks. Boom. OK, I'm done for the day. Let me go to work and do whatever else I have to do. So that's a quick way to make $1,000 a day uh, on average, you know, during trading hours. And continue to sustain and maintain your regular life. You don't got to sit in front of a computer for 5, 10, 15 hours. I'm talking about 35, 40 minutes. I'm off the stock market. Anything more than that, I, if I play around with it, I found that it's hard to win. So after 10 o'clock, it's like, okay, 10, 15 max, I'm done. There's nothing else for me to do. There's nothing, nothing else for me to get into. Unless, I'm gonna, unless I have a good tip on a buy and hold long term, you know, something like that. Other than that, there's nothing else for me to do. So I'm talking about 30 to 45 minutes getting in, getting out. I'm going to teach people the tops, the ins and outs of, of, of trading, uh, how to ninja trade. Uh, you know, we're going to go over um, trends to follow, how to research a stock properly, 
how how to understand volatility, um, you know, uh, when to exit exit a trade. I mean, all these great things I'm going to be teaching. That's August the seventh, four hours. It's going to be an amazing workshop, and I'm hoping that I can change a lot of people's lives and give them give them the ability to create a side hustle where they can generate extra income for themselves without having to go get a second job. And that's you know that's huge, uh, especially for a lot of the a lot of the people that are listening to this. Um, it's something that we stress too, because a lot of guys who are hopeful of becoming professional athletes, you know, or whatever it is that they're they're trying to do, understanding and making sure that you have your money set and that you 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 start the habit to save. I mean, it's truly crazy, and I, I can remember hearing about this these these ideas and in, in, uh, at eighteen or even younger of just if you start investing early, if you start to learn about investing early, you have no idea. The problem is, of course that's a shiny looking thing over there. I want that now. I'm going to pay for this now. Uh, who cares about all the stuff? And it's usually later in life that people have a better understanding, you know, that if you don't set yourself up now, later will be harder. If you set yourself up right now, everything in the future is almost easy. You know, it's not that you're going to have bumps, not that you're going to have, <laughs> you're going to have obstacles, you're going to have other things set up. But if you've got a certain set, especially dealing with, with money, then you have taken a huge burden off of your life and, and probably your families as well. I mean, you can then you can start worrying about helping other people, you know, and that's that's one of the things that's obviously from, you know, Abram Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, and if you don't get yourself sorted out, you can't help anybody else out. Uh, so uh, if we can throw in even just because I, I know you're going to have and teach this class, but since I've we've done a great job, I think, of getting to the juice and making things simple. What about somebody who is, say, between 18 and 30, and they've got their job, but they're going to say to you, all right, Billy, but I can't, number one, I can't leave work uh, during trading hours. Uh, number two, I've got debt, and I, I don't know where I'm supposed to get any of this extra money that you're talking about. Uh, do I need money? How much money? Is there anything that you could give uh, as far as someone who's built up that stuff for, for guys to start now? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So the first thing we have to analyze is you have to have a couple of dollars to invest, right? First of all, first and foremost. Uh, so, you know, somebody asked me in the previous time I talked about this on another show, like, what's the minimum amount you can get in for? And I recommend at least 500 bucks because that's what I started with. I started with a trading account with 500 bucks in it and I built it to $40,000 in only three months. So uh, 500 bucks at least to get in to, you know, to start doing some small options trading and things like that. Just small experimental trading. And I'm going to teach them how to pay people how to trade with a white white paper account so that they can actually trade fake money first and get good, you know, decent at it. And then they can trade with their actual real cash. Right. But then also the second thing is you have to analyze if you don't have a lot of money to begin with. You don't even have 500 bucks. You have to now analyze your 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 uh, your life and you have to find out where you can make your own sacrifices because we all have sacrifices that we can make. Maybe instead of eating out three times this week. You take that money, you go to a grocery store, buy a couple of groceries that you're going to have cooked or you cook it or somebody else cook it for you. And you then, you know, take the excess money, put that in a piggy bank. That's going to go to your stock options account. If you were going to go out and buy a couple of bags of weed, maybe you're not going to buy that weed now. You don't need it. If you don't have glaucoma, if you don't have cancer, if you don't have any kind of other ailment in your body that weed can actually cure, don't smoke it. Save your money. I never smoked a joint in a day in my life. Why? Because I don't need it. That money goes in my pocket. I don't drink liquor. Stop buying beer. Stop buying alcohol. That's another sacrifice. A very easy sacrifice to make. That stuff is expensive. I had two beers when I was 17. I never drank again. It made me sick. Saved me, saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands over the years that not drinking, not smoking. And clubs and hanging out and parties. That all costs money. So don't do that either. And before you know it, you'll have 500 bucks quickly. You can blink an eye that you can invest into yourself or have an opportunity at least to try and make some money. And as far as people who have jobs at that time, and can't take off of those specific hours. What I rec I'm going to show people how you trade overnight, because a lot of people won't start with be able to day trade right away anyway, because you have to have 25,000 minimum in your account for day trading. But you can do overnight trades and there are apps that allow you to do that, like Webull. So I'm going to show how Webull works, how you can get into trades after hours and actually get into trades and get out of trades and things like that. So there are there are options that you can utilize or, you know, methods that you can utilize and tools and apps that you can utilize to still be able to take advantage of some overnight trades uh, based off of good, you know, educated decisions. 
that can still help you get you on your way. So you can't let uh, finances be uh, hold you back. You can't let the fact that I already have a job that I work these hours hold you back. Where there's a will, there literally is a way. And this, I, I mean, I love the fact that that's how you've you've taken that approach to it because it's also it's one thing to say, yeah, you have a job. You have you yourself have plenty of things to do, and for for you to be successful with that means that you've had to find a way. I've taken the same thing. I, I've told, I think it was in the very first podcast ever, um, and I always refer to it, is that when I, I went to St. Louis University, I ended up leaving early to go to go pro. So I was in college or at university for about a year and a half. But when I showed up there, uh, I my Spanish level was high. I knew that I wanted to take Spanish just to get that get that A. You know, I have a lot of, I, I wanted to spend time playing, playing soccer and stuff like that. But while I was there, I thought, I want to learn Italian. And so I told my advisor that, that I wanted to do that. And she said, no, 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 people don't do that. You can't learn two languages at once. <laughs> she said, she said, you, they don't do that. You, you, you can't do that. And I was just like, wow, uh, what do you mean? You know, and, and so obviously what I ended up doing, because at the time I didn't have a, I didn't like math. And so I was in an algebra class. So I would bring my Italian book and I would study Italian in, in, in math. Uh, now <laughs> I like math. So I, I, I utilize that and I, I learn and, and all that stuff. But point being is that generally what I found is not when you have a problem, the it's a good thing. And I know that sounds crazy, but what it means is that you get an opportunity to solve a problem in a way that no one else can. You just have to look at problems through a very strange lens. Your perspective has to change. And if you let your mind float, and like you said, if you can get into that Zen state, I'm a huge meditator. Uh, I taught myself to lucid dream. I've had, you know, so I'm, you know, uh, I've been in that, 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 that whole realm. But what I found from all that and from meditation is that you can look at problems in ways that people are just not going to look at it. You look at a problem and you just say, oh, I can't, I can't do that. Or I can't do that right now. If you take a second and calm down and then look at the problem again, you start seeing solutions. Some of them are crazy and some of them won't work, but a few of them will work. They will work. And it, and it might be a little bit more, more uh, of a pull at first, but then once you get going, you get momentum and then you get it done. And so uh, if anything, for the people that are taking this as a thing, I mean, we're sitting here in front of a guy who has uh, about a billion, a billion different things running. And, and I know that you're also going to tell me is that you don't feel rushed and you don't feel uh, a pressure. You feel as if you have a good hold on things. Yes, you're busy, but you filled that. It's not one of I have to do this. I got to do this. Got to get to the space thing. Got to go over here and teach this. No, it seems it's structured. And so uh, I think it's, it's a misnomer necessarily that just because you have a lot of things that they're controlling you. And I think, you know, obviously whenever you have an issue like that, you adjust, you cut off some, 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 some things and you, in and you, you know, you take it. So if, if anything, uh, that's what I found. Is that, is that true? I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's 1000% accurate. Uh, you know, and I, I don't feel stressed at all. Now, am I busy? Yeah, I'm busy. But again, these are the things that I chose to be busy at and the appointments that I've allowed myself to set and commit to. Uh, and because I'm passionate about what I do and so passionate about it, it doesn't even feel like I'm working. This is what I like to do and actually love to do on a daily basis. So, you know, by the time I blink my eyes, the day is over again. I'm like, man, you know, I need another 10 hours in this day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying it's not enough hours in a day. And I really, really, truly enjoy what I do. Every single one of these different projects all synergistically flow together, even though they seem so different and so opposite and so far apart. They actually have extreme synergy. Uh, and it's allowed me to be, you know, the person that I am. And, and, and I just love it. I love the I love the, uh, you know, the ability to be so widely versed in so many topics. And it gives me so many other opportunities to help a lot more people. What I've done is I've just chased my passion and I found a need for my passion in the world. And by finding a need for my passion, the side effect is turned into revenue in my account. So I don't chase money. I only chase my passion and money is just a side effect of that. Well said. Well said. Something that I've definitely uh, aspired to continue to do. Um, and it's brought benefits only to, to my life and something that I just, you know, I want our company, uh, obviously, to to push out. So. With that, you are going to have to come back because we have forever more to, to talk about. So you are definitely going to have to come yeah. back. I know we, we, we've got you coming on with a, with a friend, of, friend of yours, which you, your guys' book isn't out yet. Or is it? You and Matt. Uh, it's not out yet. It's coming very soon. I'm going to wrap up. Matt LaCroix has done a phenomenal job 
um, you know, getting his chapters done. I'm a little bit behind on my chapters because of some travels and some TV shows that popped up at the last minute. I had to film like six seasons between two different shows, the three seasons and three seasons. It was a lot. And I had to ghost write a whole nother show for another series for somebody else. But now I'm going to go in here and knock out my chapters. I got to knock out four chapters and, um, and that book should be out hopefully within the next four months. It'll be out. We'd like to have it out before we have this big uh, event down in, in November. Okay. And so we can actually present the book there as well. Okay. Well, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Matt is amazing, guys. He's going to be coming on the podcast uh, in, in some time. But for everything that we, we've talked about, the Rolls Royce, ForbiddenKnowledge.com, all of that stuff, and uh, the options trading course, all that stuff is going to be in the link right down below. If not, it's in the show notes. Billy, definitely please come back anytime. It would be awesome. All right. All right. Listen, I, I love to be on here. This is a phenomenal platform. Uh, I appreciate every single one of your, your following. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'll definitely come back whenever you want. Just let me know. All right. Awesome. Guys, with that, we will see you later. Peace. Uh -huh.